You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And we're joined today by reporter and podcaster Paul Wagner of the American Nightmare Podcast. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. I can't thank you guys enough for having me. I love your podcast, and so it's a thrill to be questioned by you guys. As we were saying off air, Paul, usually you're the guy asking the tough yeah. questions. <laughs> That's it's- fine. It's, it, just go ahead. I'm an open book. Before we start talking about the podcast, let's actually go ahead and start with you and tell us a little bit about how you got your start in broadcasting. So when I was 14 years old, growing up just outside New York City in northern New Jersey, I was fascinated by New York radio and I would mimic all the DJs. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. And I lived in a neighborhood where we had people that lived that worked in the news business and worked for the big networks. Our next door neighbor worked for ABC, another network. I'm sorry, another neighbor worked for ABC television, another one for ABC radio, another one worked for CBS. And so I was always questioning them about the business and I was just fascinated with it. And so when I went to high school, we had a little radio station there. And then in college, I went to one year of college at William Patterson College in Wayne, New Jersey. But they had what was called a carrier current. You could only hear the station in the buildings. And I then had an opportunity to go to Mount St. Mary's College in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and they had a 10-watt radio station. So you could hear the radio station anywhere around the campus in your car. And it was just so cool. I just thought that was the neatest thing. And then while I was at school, I got my first professional job at WYCR-FM in Hanover, Pennsylvania. It was a top 40 station. And so I did the news and I did, I did some DJing. And then I went home for a year, went on a backpacking trip to Europe. And then I came home and my dad kicked me out of the house. He said, go down to Washington, <laughs> DC, move in with your sister. He says, she's got an open room, go find a job. And it was so fortuitous. And the timing was just serendipitous. I get down there and there's a little company called Metro Traffic Control that was starting up. Oh, yeah. And they were, okay. I remember. And they were, they were looking for mobile reporters that would go out in the rush hours and report on traffic. And I'm a young guy and I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. And it didn't pay anything, but it got my start in broadcasting. And my claim to fame in that job was that I was given binoculars and a two-way radio and told to go to the top of the Washington Monument and report from the top of the Washington Monument on all the bridges across the Potomac River. So I did that for a few years, and then I really clamped down on on myself, and I said, if I'm going to be a newsman, i got to find a news job. And I started at a news station here in, I'm sorry, it was an oldie station here in Washington, D.C., and I did the news there for a couple of years. Then I landed a job at the Associated Press, and then I'd been after WTOP News Radio for a job because it was a union job. And I needed a union job because I wasn't getting paid anything. And one day, just out of the blue, T.O.P. called me and said, hey, we got a job for you. Would you like to come work here? I say all that to say I spent 11 years at WTOP radio, and then I jumped over to television and went to Fox 5 DC, and I was a reporter there for 21 years. And then I took a buyout, and while I was producing podcasts for WTOP, WRC called and said, we could really use another reporter, and can you come and help us out? So I'm now working there part-time, and then I'm producing the podcast, the American Nightmare podcast for WTOP. So that's it in a nutshell. One of the questions that Kristen and I wanted to ask you, you're very unique in that you've worn these different broadcaster hats. You start out in radio, then you go over to television for a 21 year run, which is amazing that you were at one station for 21 <laughs> years. Yeah. Then you're doing podcasting and radio, and now you're back into television. What's your take on the various platforms, radio, radio, 
television, and now podcasting. What's similar and what's different about those three types of transmissions, if you will? Very good question. So with radio, I was compartmentalized to 35 seconds of story. And it, you just can't tell a story in 35 seconds. And that frustrated me. Fortunately, I had been developing sources while I was at WTOP, and then I started breaking a lot of stories. And there was a news director at Fox 5 that found out and was listening to my stories and decided, let's give this radio guy a try and uh, took a chance on me. And uh, what I really enjoyed doing by going over there was that I was going to get a lot more time to tell the story. And so I was going to get two, maybe three minutes if I'm really lucky to tell a story. And I think you can tell a good TV story in about two minutes. When I started seeing what podcasting was doing, I was just enthralled by it because I was like, wait a minute, you can really get into a story with podcasts and mm -hmm. there's no time limit and you can add and subtract and nobody's going to tell you, sorry, Wagner, you can't have that amount of time. And our series have, some of them gone 45 minutes, gone an hour, but it based on what I had and what I thought was interesting. And so I think the podcast format is my favorite at this point because of the ability to be able to just add everything and not leave anything out. Because in TV, you're always leaving something out. Yeah, that's what I love about it. And that's definitely something that we like to being able to devote yeah. as much time as we need to a subject so that you can really get all of the information out there. Exactly. For anybody who's not familiar with American Nightmare, go ahead and give us a summary and a breakdown about American Nightmare. So what happened was Fox 5 offered me a buyout. And uh, I was at that time in my early 60s. And the buyout was a nice chunk of change. And I went to my wife and I said, what do you think? And she said, you got to take the money because I was coming up on being able to take my pension. And then I had this story that I really wanted to tell in a podcast. And I'd already done one podcast for Fox 5. I did it on a notorious murder here in the city, which is soon going to be a, a peacock documentary that I'm part of. I did a podcast for Fox 5, and so that gave me the taste. It was mm -hmm. like of what podcasts can do and how fun they are to put together. And so I took the buyout, and I had this story, and I started writing it. I took a summer, and I wrote the story. And I had to get the three children of the murder victim to agree to tell their stories. It wasn't easy. and They were a little apprehensive, but I was able to talk them into it. And fortunately, their stories came out and just were just so touching to hear what happened to them and their mother. And so that was called Murder in a Safe Place. It was Sherry Crandall was her name. She was a nurse and she was murdered inside her office at a hospital in Prince George's County, Maryland in 1998. And so that's why we called it Murder in a Safe Place. At the end of that summer, I talked to several good friends who frequently give me advice. And I said, what do you think I should do with this? And they said, why don't you take it to a news organization? Because you, you're going to need a backer. You're going to need somebody to support you. And so I approached the Washington Post. They weren't interested. But I went to WTOP and they jumped on it immediately. And they wanted it. And part of the reason they wanted it is because they have a stake. Hubbard Broadcasting has a stake in a server called Podcast One. And they were looking for stories. And I went to sign a contract with them to get this thing going and off the ground. And fortunately, they had a really good editor there who helped me. And we basically rewrote the whole podcast. Oh, and wow. then, <laughs> yeah, I know. But it turned out so much better because I can write, but having an editor is a good thing. So that's how it came together. And it's an open-ended deal with WTOP. And then I we came up with the second one called Unknown Subject, which is out now, which has got nine episodes and now I'm looking for a new subject. One of our questions was, so you've done several seasons. How do you choose the cases you want to cover? That's a very good question. So the 21 years I was at Fox 5, I got to know a lot of cops. And I got to know a lot of cold case cops. And I was fascinated with cold cases. And the boss at Fox 5 then gave me what we call at the time a franchise. And so every Saturday night, I'd feature a cold case. And it was usually an extended story, something that was like five minutes long. And that's long for, w for, uh, for television. I got to know a lot of cops. And so I got to know and hear about a lot of these cold cases. And with Sherry Crandall, I got to know the detective many years ago, and I featured her murder on Channel 5. And then I stayed in touch with the detective, and I stayed in touch with Sherry's daughter, Tiffany. 
so after I took the buyout, I approached Tiffany and I said, what would you think about me telling your mother's story in a podcast? And it took a little bit of persuasion because she wasn't mm-hmm. really clear on what a podcast really was. Her brother, <clears throat> excuse me, her brother, Darren, is a cop. He was a little apprehensive, but he came around. And so once they had agreed to it, and then I called the detective and I said, look, I got the kids on board. Will you do it? He said he would. And then WTOP, when I went to them, they said, all right, if they're all on board, you need to go to the police and tell them you need an open book on this case because you can't do this story and say sources say this and sources say that. We need to be able to say what we know about this case. And I fortunately knew the former commander of homicide who also agreed to take part. And so that's how it all came together. Yeah. One of the things that I was very curious about is, is the level of cooperation from law enforcement, because we know from personal experience that there are times when law enforcement is a little leery of getting involved in media and podcasts and various other things. It it seems pretty clear that your relationships with law enforcement have helped you. Oh, there's no question. Fortunately, I built a good reputation here in town. And and because I had so many cop friends, they all talked to each other. And I knew that they were talking to each other about, can you really trust Wagner? And can you tell him things and tell him it's off the record and he's going to trust you? And and I'm sure some of them uh, tested me on that. But yeah, that and the other part to this too is that although the detective in Murder in a Safe Place is still the lead detective and he still works for the Prince George's County Police, Most of the others were already retired. It's easier to get a detective to open up if they've been retired because they feel they feel like they can speak more freely rather than having the public information office breathing down their neck saying you you have to be careful in what you're going to say. So that's that that's part of it. And in unknown subject, a lot of the people that I talked to were retired and that that helped as well. So talk to us a little bit about the case that is at the heart of unknown subject. Just give us a little brief overview of that, if you would. Wow. It's a tall order, <laughs> if, I know. If but... it's possible. <laughs> I know. Let me try the elevator ex- pitch. <laughs> let, let me try and explain it this way. When I was at Fox 5, I covered Christine Merzion's murder. She was a brilliant doctoral candidate, scientist, and she was walking home from a party one night in Georgetown, and she got pulled into a wooded area and just brutally murdered. I stayed on that story for years, and I stayed in touch with the detectives who were covering it. I broke several stories about it, including the link. At one time, it was several years later, a detective pulled me aside and told me that there's a DNA link between Christine's murder and a series of rapes in Montgomery County, Maryland. That had never been reported before. I broke that angle of the story and then just kept at it. Once I had finished Murder in a Safe Place, I figured this was a good one to do because they had made an arrest in the case. So I guess the short version of this story is that this was a man named Giles Warwick who worked in construction in Montgomery County, Maryland, and he was accused of going out at night and committing these awful, vicious rapes. And then he stopped because the cops couldn't find DNA after a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. So after 1998, so from 1991 to 1998, they knew they had a DNA trail from this guy. They knew they had the same guy. They just didn't know who it was. So years go by, and then the FBI gets involved, and then they dub him the Potomac River Rapist. And that got national attention. And then the case just went cold again. It didn't go anywhere. They had the DNA, of course, in CODIS, but it wasn't hitting on anything. And it's just this guy went off the grid. In 2018 into 19, the police decided to try genetic genealogy. And and that's how they found him. The story is just so involved. It's hard to (laughs) just encapsulate it for you. (laughs) But yeah, the thrilling part about the story is that I got a lot of people to talk to me. I got a lot of people to tell me their views on the case and what they did on the case. And then the timing worked out perfectly for us because he was going to trial. And as he was going to trial, the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the District of Columbia was releasing more and more information. And so as I was writing the final versions of the podcast, we were getting all these new documents and all this new information. And so I was on the phone with a producer at WTOP and we're talking about what what we should add, what we should leave out. And then we got the gift of a lifetime. Anybody in TV news or radio news will tell you that getting something like this is just a gift that you just don't get all the time. And that is the U.S. Attorney's Office, the prosecutors, We're trying to convince the judge to allow them to 
introduce certain evidence. And they introduced the two interviews that Giles Warwick did with the police in his house before they arrested him. Then the next day after they arrested him, once they introduced it into evidence in the courthouse, it's public record. So I went to the judge and said, we're requesting uh, copies of these interviews and the judge turned them over. And so we were able to include them in the podcast, which just, I thought, made the last eight, episode eight just really, I just think it sounded fantastic having that guy in there. That seems so unusual in listening to the podcast and then to have the interview with the suspect at his home and they're having this kind of quiet conversation, but it's about critical information. They're easing into it. I remember when they were asking him, have you ever lived in Maryland? And you can picture them probably at this guy's kitchen table or something, just easing into it. And the guy is allowing himself to begin to tell the story. But I don't remember ever hearing interviews like that before. I mean, it, that sounds exceptionally rare. That's what's so exciting about genetic genealogy is they went on November 7th, 2019 to talk with relatives that they thought were connected to the unknown subject. Okay. And so they, they had narrowed it down to one family tree. And on the same day, several detectives went out and interviewed family members to see about a missing link. They knew that it was that the killer was in this family tree. They just didn't know where he fit. The detectives get this one person, this family member, sits down, and the family member says, well, there's a part to our family that we don't really talk about, and that is my father had an affair with a woman, fathered a child, and so I have a half-brother. Wow, the bells went off, and wow. the detectives got his name, and they started running his name, and he had a criminal record, and he lived in Montgomery County at the times the rapes were taking place in areas where the rapes were happening. They had a really good feeling that this was the guy they wanted. So they went to a judge and they got a warrant for his DNA, but they realized that he was in South Carolina. So if they go down to South Carolina with the warrant, there's an affidavit attached to the warrant. And according to South Carolina law, if you carry out and execute a search warrant, you have to give that person the affidavit, which would then explain all of their evidence. So they said, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to go and knock on his door, surprise him. We're going to record it with a little tape recorder, and we're going to sit there and just chat with them. Tell them, this is what we're doing. We're trying to eliminate people. There were a series of rapes in Montgomery County back in the 90s, and a woman was murdered. And that's what they did. And they knew they had the search warrant in their back pocket if he wouldn't give up his DNA. But as they were talking to him, sitting on his couch in his living room at 630 in the morning, he agrees to give up his DNA. He just said, okay. And the police were astonished. And the detective, Todd Williams, he looked at him. He says, look, I just want you to know, you can say no. Okay. You can say no. But if you're giving up your DNA now, you're giving it up voluntarily. And he just said, okay. And wow. he did. <laughs> and then they take the DNA and they have detectives outside the house. They run outside with the swab, the buckle swab from the DNA. They give it to this detective. And detective... And then he and another detective race back to Montgomery County, Maryland with the buckle swab and take it to the lab. And by about 11 o'clock that night, same wow. night, they had a direct match and they knew they had their guy. Wow. Yeah. In a podcast wow. that's full of twists and turns. Yeah. And there's so much about the way you put the story together that's so compelling. But I remember sitting there literally on the edge of my seat when we got to the place where they're <laughs> mm -hmm. interviewing him and he agrees to give up his DNA. Yeah. And yet they explained to him, you don't have to do this. So it right. isn't like they lied to the guy. Yeah. He's since passed on. But what made you think that Giles Warwick just decided to give up his DNA? I think that he knew he was cornered. In fact, I talked to Allison DePoy about this, so the detective from Montgomery County who made the arrest along with Todd Williams. She thinks that he had a plan in his mind all along on what was going to happen and what he was going to do if police ever knocked on his door and that he had a getaway plan. And so he figured because the police told him and, of course, they 
allowed to lie. And they told him it would take six to eight weeks to get their results back. Whether he ate that or not, I'm not sure. But we do know that right after the police left, he started to get his plan in place to take off. We don't know where he was going to go other than in the middle of the night, lights start coming on inside his house. The police have the house under surveillance. They realize he's on the move. They were waiting and waiting for the confirmation that it was a direct match. As soon as they got that, that it was a direct match, the police officers who were watching the house, they called Todd and Allison, who were nearby at a motel, and said, we got movement at this house. We need to go. They all went back to the house, knocked on the door. He answers the door, and they took him into custody and charged him. But he had laid out on his kitchen counter his plan. He'd left a, a letter which we call the consciousness of guilt letter, where he apologizes to the woman he was living with. And he's signed over titles to certain things, whether it was a house or he had a he owned a house in Frederick County, Maryland. So he signed over some titles. He left some cash and he left this note and then he was going to go. And we don't know where he was going to go, but the cops were watching the house and sorry, pal, <laughs> we're going to lock you up. Were they planning on conducting a raid on the house the next morning at 6.30 a.m.? Yes, that is correct. So their plan was to go and arrest him the next morning at 6.30 in the morning. But that's why they had the house under surveillance. They just had no idea what this guy had planned. They got a sense that he knew the jig was up, that he was done. Because he he's not a dummy. He knew by giving up his DNA, that was probably going to be the end. But they had also lied and said it was going to take six to eight weeks to get results. So he probably thought he had time to get yeah. away. Tell us a little bit about, and I love this name for the record. Tell us about Steve Smugs Smugurski. <laughs> he's the bike cop who worked on this case. Talk to us a little bit about him. That is just the best name I have ever heard in my life. It's fantastic. Steve is a revelation as far as being a bike cop who was curious about ancestry, knew how to do searches on computers, and made himself available to the police to do some of this work. This was before genetic genealogy really started to grab hold. And so he was a bike cop working downtown in Silver Spring, Maryland. Yeah, he goes by Smugs. Everybody calls him Smugs. His name is Steve Smugoreski. And just a lovely guy. I've interviewed him a couple of times now. He solved the unsolvable. He solved Amazing. the unsolvable. Yeah, it's, it's, that's what's just so fascinating about it. And so the backstory to Steve, very quickly, the police at one point wanted to hold ceremony, hold a ceremony for all of the family members of fallen officers, okay? And they couldn't find a family member from their first fallen officer back in 1920, something like that. The police went to Steve and said, hey, do you think you might be able to dig into this? You, you like this kind of stuff. He said, sure, let me try. And so he did. And he found a relative that wow. the police never knew about. And now they come to the ceremony every year and they honor this officer who had died back in 1921. So the cold case guys are going, wait a minute, Smugs, I think you need to come up here and help us out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, some newer, new cases. He then solved two or three very quickly stuff via DNA that they'd had for years that they had no idea who it was. And they sent it out to Parabon Nano Lab. I don't mm -hmm. know if your listeners know about Parabon. They do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they do. Yeah. So Parabon, they put this DNA into Jedmatch. And before you know it, they've given Steve these leads to follow. And it's a case involving a shopkeeper who was murdered inside his store in Comus, Maryland, back in the early 90s. The cops could just not solve this case. The DNA just was not hitting anywhere. They didn't have any suspects. But suddenly, Steve starts working on it, and he finds a family tree that seems to be working. And uh, long story short, they zeroed in on the killer's brother first. They went and talked to him determined that he wasn't the killer. And then they went down to Virginia Beach and they got DNA from his brother and it was a direct match. And wow. he was married to a retired DC police officer and he was working as a mechanic. Wow. And from what we can tell, he had never committed another crime where he was caught for or prosecuted for. So it was as if he had committed this one horrible crime, killing the shopkeeper and then never did anything again. 
That case was such a mystery, too, because did we ever figure out like a motive for mm -hmm. that particular homicide? I remember when that case broke a couple of years ago. I'm trying to think of his name right now. I'm, right now, I'm drawing a blank on the victim's name. But I interviewed his daughter, lovely, lovely person. Basically, it was a robbery gone bad. He had gone into the shop. The shopkeeper was working by himself. He went to buy a bottle of wine, and then he smashed the bottle and used it as a weapon right. to to get money. And in the course of stabbing the shopkeeper, he cut himself. Right. And then as he was leaving the shop, his blood was dripping out the door. The police knew that this was the killer's blood. They knew it was his DNA, but they couldn't get anywhere. With right. It. Nothing in CODIS, no matches Nothing, anywhere. No. And then Steve solves the unsolvable. It's really wow. incredible. Yeah. I and he's done it with a few other cases, too. Yeah. I've actually spoken to Steve over the phone. <laughs> he's a super yeah. nice guy and incredibly is, yeah. modest about oh, his very own modest. Yes. solves and his own capability. Yes. The guy's actually a rock star. Yeah. Yeah, oh, he totally is. In fact, when I interviewed him for Murder in a Safe Place, he he got emotional. He said he thought he was getting help from upstairs. Oh, and I said, oh, wow. and he started to get choked up. Huh? And I said, so you think a higher being is helping you, Steve? He goes, I do. Uh huh. Yeah, pretty incredible. Wow. It really <laughs> is. Yeah, he, maybe he's right. Very well, could be. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. You've been in the journalism business for a good amount of time now, and I know that you've seen the technology for solving crimes mm -hmm. just explode, especially over the last couple of years with forensic genetic genealogy. Do you foresee yourself continuing to do crime podcasting and crime reporting? And what do you foresee continuing to happen with the way that we solve and report on crimes? I can't wait to get another one going. <laughs> I just got to <laughs> pick the right one because I need six episodes. For a series, you can't just do it with one or two. You really need to have a story that will get people to jump from one episode to the next. And so I have some ideas, but nothing solid just yet. When I interviewed Todd Williams for episode nine of Unknown Subject, Todd said that he's telling everybody in the D.C. Police Department that will listen to him that genetic genealogy is the future. Yeah. And that this is how we're going to solve the coldest of crimes. And I can't agree with him more. I'm fascinated by it. And the fact that my first two podcasts for WTOP involved genetic genealogy, just a thrill for me to be able to explain to people how it works why it works, why it's not a, an infringement on people's privacy. That's what I love being able to do is these podcasts allow you to get down into the nitty gritty and explain things. There's no cutoff. There's no, Paul, you can't go longer than that. We've got it. And so I've, I interviewed this guy, John Fitzgerald, who is a former top official with the Montgomery County Police. He's now the chief of police in the Chevy Chase Police Department. He took an interest in genetic genealogy because he saw a few years ago, there were these Mar Maryland, at least one Maryland state legislator who wanted to legislate it out. Oh, he wanted, it, yeah, they oh, moved it. So there are people in Annapolis that have completely moved in the wrong direction. Yeah. And he saw that and he was like, oh boy, I got to jump in here. And he did. And he was able to convince this legislator that his position on this was wrong because he wanted to outlaw it completely. Yes. I remember and that. So, yeah, that. so they, there, there is, there is a law now in place that detectives have to follow. If they want to use genetic genealogy to solve a crime, they have to get an approval from a judge. And so it's, it's just another step for these detectives who are trying to solve cold cases. Anyway, John, I was able to take my interview with John and let him explain from beginning to end why it's important and why it's not an infringement on privacy. And mm -hmm. it just fit perfectly into the podcast. Do you think those decisions made by some of the Maryland legislature will impact solving cases using investigative genetic genealogy in a negative way? I stay in touch with detectives who are trying to use genetic genealogy. And I think if this was a barrier at this point, I'd be hearing about it. And I'm not. I know that there's detectives who have a stack of cases 
And my understanding of it, at least the initial approach to it, is that they have to go to a judge with, I've described it as an affidavit, but they right. have not described it that way. They've described it as a, just an explanation of what they want to do. And then they just have to have a judge sign it. It's not like a search warrant where you're looking for probable cause. At this point, I haven't heard any kind of adverse moves by legislators in Annapolis to put a damper on this kind of investigative work. But I'll tell you this, the more that you can highlight the successes of it, I think the less these legislators are going to have any kind of backing. Is there a case that you're particularly familiar with that you would like to see genetic genealogy used on that hasn't had the treatment done to it yet? Kristen, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> She's good at those. I know that they're working on cases right now with genetic genealogy, but let me tell you about one case that I did back in October. I have a good friend who's a, a retired assistant U.S. attorney. Here in the District of Columbia, we're, we have to use the U.S. Attorney's Office because we're not a state, and so we don't have an elected prosecutor. Her name is Deb Sines, and Deb told me, she goes, I really want you to shine a light on this case. She put me in touch with the brother of one of the victims, and then she gave me some other information that was public record. She wasn't doing anything untoward. She was just steering me in the right direction. It was two women who were murdered inside the same apartment building on the same floor, two or three doors apart, three years apart. Wow. Both killed wow. in the ex both killed in the same manner. Now, one of the women, her name was Flo Esseline. She was a Harvard graduate and she'd come down to DC to work for a law firm. And then there was another woman named Greta Rainey. And Greta was killed after Flo. I started talking to Bernard, Flo's brother, and he really wanted to do a story. And we talked for weeks about it and how we could put it together because it was just going to be, there is DNA, but it hasn't gotten anywhere. And then it was serendipitous. Bernard, as we're talking, gets a phone call from a cold case detective in the DC police department. And he goes, look, I've got some information. We want to tell a story. We want to get this information out. I know they knew that I was talking to Bernard because I'm not sure exactly how I think I emailed questions about it. And so the cops in the cold case unit knew that I was looking into the case. Turns out they took the DNA from both of these cases, which that's a whole nother story that goes down a rabbit hole. But it was very hard to get the DNA because they were on slides from the medical examiner's office from years ago. How far back did these cases go? 80, yeah, some mid to early 80s. The fascinating thing was, and serendip serendipitous, as I say, is that while I was talking to Bernard about doing a story, the cold case detective calls Bernard and says, hey, I've got some news. We not only have gotten profiles from the DNA, which we hadn't had before, but we put it into CODIS and they linked. So we now know... The same man killed Greta and killed Flo, and they don't know who it is. It's another unknown subject. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And there that's another that's one of those genetic genealogy cases. Absolutely. It's a perfect case for genetic genealogy. Yeah. But like I said, it goes just goes down a rabbit hole if I try to explain it. But it was DNA that they never had put into profiles for years and years and years because they were on slides and they were afraid to open the slides. And that's my it is slides from the medical examiner's office back when they were doing rape kits before anybody knew that you could get DNA. So when the cold case detectives started looking into these cases and realized they had these slides, they finally opened them and then linked the cases. And so, they had workable wow. DNA samples from those slides from yeah. cases stretching back into the 1980s. We've reminded our listeners when we talk about the Colonial Parkway murders and my sister Kathy and her girlfriend Rebecca Dowski's murders, as well as the other murders in the Colonial Parkway cases, those cases stretched from 86 to 89. And even then, DNA was barely making it out of the lab at that point. Those of us that are living now in 2023... You hear about these things and you think they've always been around, but we're here to remind them, <laughs> yes. look, these things have not been around that long. We're talking about science that's only 30 or so years old. Right. In a case like these two related cases for Flo and Greta's murder, very strange to have two women killed in the same apartment building a couple of years apart. And there's a linkage right there even before they mm -hmm. had the CODIS hit. 
very strong chance, even before they linked them scientifically, that those two assaults were somehow related. Well, well that might be your next podcast right there. <laughs> you may have hit on something. You know, <laughs> I can't find Greta Rainey's family. We don't know where they are. She's, well, I haven't been able to get that. And as you, when you're doing these stories, you got to have a family. You yeah. got to have yeah, it's somebody helpful. that can put the emotion into it. And Bernard is a wonderful guy. And Flo's brother. <clears throat> Flo's brother. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, he had been in touch with several people over the years asking about his sister's case. And he mm-hmm. talked to lots of people like this who are constantly wondering what's happened to my case, to my sister's case, right. father's case, of mother's course. case. Yeah. And occasionally they come to me and, and then I make calls and try and help them out and see what there is out there. And with Bernard, because Deb signs the AUSA, she's retired now, because she told me to look into it and put me in touch with Bernard. That's how we were able to put it all together. So we did that story, I think, back in October. And so you can Google it and look it up. Rainey sounds like an unusual enough name that you might be able to find some relatives somewhere. I talked to the cold case detective about it. His name is Dan Whalen. He's been there a long time. He said that they found... They think they found a brother-in-law living somewhere down in the Norfolk area, but they haven't been able to make a connection. And that was back in October when I was talking to him about that. So it could be that they've made some connection. Yeah, until you can get a family member. We're halfway there with Bernard, at least able to speak for Flo's family. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, she was a really interesting woman. She she graduated from Harvard and came down to work for a law firm. She was working as a paralegal. And she just she's one of these young ladies that just wanted to go off on her own. She grew up in New York. Now, here's a little twist of the story that I'll throw at you. One of the reasons why this case got so much attention at the time is because three other women from the same law firm all ended up being murdered. Is this in Virginia or in... No, two here in D.C. and one in Prince George's County. But they are not related, and we know that for a fact. Okay. How is that possible? Yeah, so we know now because of DNA that the same person killed Flo and Greta Rainey. Right. This other person, her name was Catherine Schilling. There was a man named Donald Gates who was railroaded by prosecutors using junk science to prosecute him, sent him to prison for over 20 years for killing Catherine Schilling. And they found DNA in that case and tested it and determined that he was not the killer. He was let out of prison and he won a lawsuit. Because of the lawsuit, the U.S. Attorney's Office decided to see if they could find the real killer in CODIS. And this one's a little complicated. The, the prosecutor told me he had to do a keyboard search, and I'm not sure what that is. But in any event, they found the real killer, of Catherine Schilling, but he's dead. So they know that a different man killed Catherine Schilling, and they know a different man killed Flo. And then there's a the third woman. They believe that she was killed during a robbery outside an apartment in Prince George's County. So the three are not related. But for years, it was the talk of chatter amongst people about how three women who all work for the same law firm ended up getting murdered. It does seem awfully strange. I would imagine that sometimes you do have detectives, current or retired detectives, that would like you to explore certain cases that have stuck. Oh, definitely. Oh, absolutely. That was the case with Flo, for sure. Dan Whalen, when the commander in charge of cold case found out that I was looking into the murder, he told the cold case detective. And then for weeks, Bernard and I were just chatting and we hadn't come up with an idea on how we were going to tell the story. And then when they got the connection with the DNA through CODIS and linking those two murders, Dan Whalen said to Bernard, he called Bernard and he said, this case needs to have some light. And I know Paul is working on this case with you would you do a story? And Bernard was said, of course. So he came down in October and I interviewed him and I interviewed the commander of homicide and uh, and then we put the story together. So was I, this a radio story or a television story? No, it was a television story for Channel 4. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'd love yeah. to see that. Boy, this sounds fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. was not familiar with this case until you started telling us the story. Yeah, I'll send you a link. If you just type uh, Flo's name, it's it's a Haitian name, so it's hard to spell, but it's pronounced uh, Florence Esselin. And in fact, if you just if you think if you Google Florence Esselin and Greta Rainey and Paul Wagner, it'll come up. It'll, it'll come up. Yeah, it'll and come up. Yeah. We'll include that in the show notes for this yeah. interview as well. This is fascinating. 
Yeah. It's amazing that these two women could be connected in death. And this sounds like this would be perfect for genetic genealogy. Mm. Oh, absolutely. That, like I said, the genetic genealogy is solving the unsolvable. <laughs> That's yeah. the, the cases that, that the detectives have been beating their heads against a wall over for years. Yeah. And, sudden, and suddenly this new technique comes along and wow, it's just fascinating. Of all of the cases that you've covered, and you've given us quite a few at this point, is there one in particular that has such a stranglehold on you that you're never going to be able to forget it, that you'll always have a place in your heart for it? There are a number of them. Some have been solved, and it's mainly because of the connections that I made with family members. But there's a murder mystery here in D.C. that fascinates everyone. As I mentioned off the top here, it's about to become a Peacock documentary, and it's about the murder of a a young lawyer named Robert Wan, and it's spelled W-O-N-E, Robert Wan. And Robert was murdered inside a home in the DuPont Circle area back in 2006, I believe it was. He was stabbed to death, and there were three people inside the home at the time that he was stabbed. No one has been charged with Robert's murder, but the three men who lived in the house, who were all a polyamorous family, they were charged with obstruction of justice and a charge with conspiracy and tampering with evidence, I believe, too. Anyway, there was a sensational trial, sensational trial. It was just one of those trials. I covered the Chandra Levy trial. This one was just off the charts with people's interest in it. And anyway, they chose a bench trial rather than a jury trial. And they were they were acquitted. The story is so involved. It's just it's so involved. I can't even encapsulate it for you. There is a podcast out there that I did called The Mystery on Swan Street. And then I am also the narrator of this upcoming documentary. And I don't know if they've named it yet, but um, I recently did some more work on it. And it's coming from Peacock. In that case is when you talk with fellow reporters who've been around forever and the Robert Wonkos case always comes up. People just oh. are fascinated with tossing ideas around on what happened. In fact, there was a, an Audible podcast done on it back, I think, two years ago. So, a yeah, di- there's a different one than you did. A different one than I did. I took part in it. I was interviewed about I was interviewed for it. And I don't remember the name of it, to be honest with you. Yeah, but I'm um, sure we could find it, though. That case, the prosecutor that had that case, he feels like the judge in the case, Lynn Leibowitz was her name. She wrote a 17-page opinion on why she couldn't convict the men. And he feels as if that she could have convicted them, but she said that she couldn't get past the reasonable doubt. And so she acquitted them. And this, there have been several stories examining it. It's been all over the newspapers, magazines. And I guess probably the the most intriguing aspect of the case is that the police believed that the knife that was used and found on a table, night table next to Robert was a plant knife. And that was the big fight in this case was whether or not that knife was a plant knife. But the prosecutors couldn't convince Judge Leibowitz that was the case. And so these guys walked and nobody knows what happened in that house that night. How strange. And oh, it's how- a very strange case. Very strange case. I was also thinking, how often do murder cases end up as bench trials as opposed to jury trials? I can tell you a little bit about that. So these men, these three men were gay men, and they lived a pally polyamorous life. They were into bondage, some stuff that church ladies may not have found to be too Yeah. Okay. okay? Yeah. So they might have had a hard time getting a fair trial. Yeah. So the defense said, we want a bench trial. And the prosecutors, they could have challenged it, but they also thought about it and said, you know what? It's probably true that DC is filled with these Baptist women who would sit there in the jury box and maybe have a tough time with that. Very interesting. What a strange story, though. And it appears that this poor man was murdered and no one was ever held to account. No, but there's no double jeopardy here because they weren't charged with murder. And Glenn Kirshner is his name. I'm sure you've seen him on MSNBC. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. The political. The last couple of, yeah. Glenn was a prosecutor in that case. So he feels that after this documentary airs, that maybe something will loosen up and they'll finally be able to find out what happened. But here's the key part to the story. Robert is a straight man and he was married. He worked for Radio Free. Not, was it Radio Free? Radio Free Asia. He and Joe Price, who lived in the house, were good friends from William & Mary. He had a a late-night interview with people at Radio Free Asia, 
He had just taken a job there as a general counsel. So he asked Joe if he could stay over at the house and because he wanted to go to this meeting and then he had another one very early the next morning. So rather than go home to his house in Oakton, Virginia, he asked Joe if he could stay there. Uh And so that's the twist in this case. And that was straight. And the three men living in the house are gay. Robert, according to prosecutors and police, was sexually assaulted before he was stabbed. Oh, that's strange. Oh, yeah. It's a crazy case. Well, it's probably the the most fascinating murder cases in D.C. that hasn't been solved. Amazing. And so this will ultimately be a peacock. Will this be a multi-part true crime? My understanding is it's a two-part hour-long documentary where all these people are interviewed. I'm the narrator because I was the reporter they asked to help them with the case. So I sat for a whole day being interviewed, and then I did some more work on it recently, doing some voiceovers. It's a true a true crime mystery, but they stick to the facts. It's not one of the... My understanding is they're not sensationalizing it at all. All They're sticking to the facts about everything in the case. It's it's two hours, and I'm not exactly sure when it's coming out because I think it was already it was supposed to be out back in September or something like that. Does Glenn Kirshner participate as the former? He does. He does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's funny. I see him now doing political commentary and that sort of thing. I know he was a prosecutor though because he does reference it. He's interviewed in this documentary, and I interviewed him for the original podcast that I did on the story, The Mystery on Swan Street, that I did for Fox 5. So, I, in fact, that was the first time Glenn ever sat down to talk about the case because he had just retired, and I called him up and asked him if he would take part, and he agreed. So, it was the first time anybody had interviewed him because when you're working for the U.S. Attorney's Office, you're not allowed to do interviews, but once he retired, he was fair game. Paul, for anybody who wants to locate all of your various podcast endeavors, where can they find all of your podcasts? You can find them on any platform, anywhere you get a podcast. It's called American Nightmare Series. And then there there are three podcasts in the series. The first one's called 22 Hours. That was done by another reporter. And then I did Murder in a Safe Place and the most recent one, Unknown Subject, which is nine episodes long. And so you can binge on it if you like. So yeah, any anywhere you get podcasts, just type in, you can either just type in WTOP or American Nightmare Series, you'll find it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to having you back to talk about the next iteration of American Nightmare. That was a fascinating discussion. Thank you for having me. That's going to do it for this episode of Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.